The world of Guardia is big and grand, filled with mysteries and secrets, yet it is also a very strange place. The detail which might be stunning for the player is that the races of the world and the races presented during the character creation screen are completely different. This is a very unique feature of the game, since in other titles, if you choose from an elf, a human or a dwarf, then you expect to encounter them on your adventure. Not in Wizard 7 though. In this game, you and your party have entered a strange new world of which you know nothing. And as we've perceived from the introductory sequence, this feeling is sustained for quite a while. Yet this sense of unfamiliarity also contributes to the excitement of discovery and expectations. There are legends and rumors which you can learn that foreshadow your future encounters. For example, in the library of the new city you can find the book of fables. Within it, you read the tale of a girl who was gifted with the ability to predict future events. Yet this gift provoked envy from her four evil sisters, which at some point had planned to steal her face. She predicted it and, sad and hurt, she casted a spell which turned her face to gold. The sisters came and divided her facial features between them. Yet the girl was still alive, just cut off from the outside world. You read the tale and learn that the witches lived at the mountains. This knowledge serves as a build-up for the future event. Moments of foreshadowing like this, which tell of things that will be relevant dozens of hours later, contribute not only to the setting and the lore, but also to the sense of a vast world, which is crucial, since there is a difference between making the world big and making the world feel big. Wizardry 7 is a very big game, yet such moments are what makes you feel it. In the same library you can learn from a wise historian about the days of glory, which are, sadly, long gone. His sad chronicles have weight, since you've seen the pathetic present state for yourself. While walking around the streets of the city, you feel the atmosphere of melancholy. Houses look bleak, the shops have only scarce items and the rooms lack content. All such details combined with the unappealing visuals bring this almost post-apocalyptic atmosphere, which is only enhanced by existential narrations. When you go into the dark area and stand in front of the Sea of Sorrows, you hear a narration which manages to capture both the wonder of the sea and the sadness which is awoken by understanding your insignificance to the sea in comparison. The choice of words and tone and the division between different paragraphs is written in such a way as to bring a distinct mood, a sense of melancholy. It is just an example, but this sense is present in each narration, which seem to be constantly aware of man's mortality. There is a sailor who lives near the sea, and he tells stories of a dangerous beast from the deep. Another magnificent piece of foreshadowing. Yet, while we are here, let's steal from the man. This is actually a flaw of the game. Characters have limitless pockets, so if you steal a potion, then you can go out, and then come back, and the potion is gonna be in his pocket again. The thievery itself is a necessity at the early stages of the game, because, quite frankly, you are going to be literally trying to survive in this world. There is almost no one who wishes to help you or guide you. You are nothing. No one knows you, you have no strength, no money, and therefore no one cares for you. The world of Wizard 7 is a cruel dog-eat-dog -dog world. Which is actually one of the reasons why I call it grounded and even realistic. The characters of this game behave egoistically, caring for themselves first and those who are their friends second. Pretty much how real life people do. So at the beginning of the game you are at the bottom and you have to somehow gain strength, money and reputation by using any method you can. And this, along with how desolate the world appears, is the reason why you're going to feel lonely, like the world is empty and alien. This melancholic, grounded and even realistic atmosphere is present for the entirety of the game, yet this initial impression of a lifeless world starts to deteriorate as you learn of your competition, adventurers just like you. During gameplay, these adventurers go around the world on their own, doing their own thing. 
like searching for treasures, fighting each other, making alliances, and trading. So remember how in the dungeon there was an empty chest? Turns out one of those guys have opened it and now has a map. Maps are very important items, so you have to get them. But who got the map and where is he? To learn the answers you can go to Tavern for instance and ask about the rumors. Hey, this is the same sailor you stole potions from. This game is old, Seal. Uh, technological limitations made it necessary to reuse old character models. The information that the Keeper of the Tavern provides will be dependent on your reputation with his race. But this is not the only option. Shopkeepers or other people can also spread rumors and there is a variety of ways you can hunt for information on your own. And uh, as soon as you learn about the possessor of an important item, you approach him. This is as best time as any to talk about the diplomacy system. While confronting a person with whom you are not familiar with, you can't ask questions directly. At first you have to prepossess them. This may be done by the excellent use of the diplomacy skill, bribing, threatening, charming with magic or all the above. Basically you are trying to get allied with the subject in order to exchange various information and trade. This is if you want to get allied. You can also just attack the person and if you are strong and quick enough, cause the adventures are often deadly and if they are not, they can run away. You can get everything from his possessions. Its downside is that you also kill everything that he could have told you and you also spoil your reputation with his race. So with that said, after I've asked around and learned that the person called Tracker Relic had the map. I got a hold of him and decided that murder was my finest option. As a result, the rumor about this murder has spread and every Umpani, that's how this race is called, started hating me, including an important merchant of the smuggled weaponry. So I had to bribe him and use the diplomacy skill in order to convince him to do business with me again. But soon after that I have met another tracker and after I've tried to communicate with him he attacked me. I defended myself and during the fight he escaped, leaving me with all his bodyguards, of which no trace was ever found. After that no amount of bribing or arguments could let me convince the tracker to make truce with me. Same goes for merchant. But after I've done some quests for Umpani and helped them out, the tracker and the merchant actually got friendly even without any truce making. The Umpani are a very militaristic and disciplined culture, so that is how you can earn that trust. But one sleazy rat merchant of stolen goods was making deals with me even after I've killed all important figures of his nation. All it took is a little bribe and a couple of friendly words to make him forget all of my misdeeds. The approach and communication can vary from person to person. That is a simple yet effective diplomacy system which combined with the free roaming adventures gives this game a sense of dynamic environment that many other RPGs lack. But the adventures are only representatives of their cultures and often your first impression turns out to be incorrect. As an example of this I want to delve into my favorite nation of this world, the monks. At first monks seem to be a carefree bunch of guys. They appear simple and light-hearted, but when you start to learn more you understand that this was only an impression. Their culture revolves around dreams and through them they try to find their true selves. They induce themselves with drugs to release their inner dreams which they believe to come from an invisible creature inside of them. Within the creature lies your true answer, the realization of your truest dream. When you release this creature, you realize your dream, yet the downside is that you also stop dreaming, since the creature is now gone. Monks also believe that the man without dreams forever walks the land of the living dead. This is a spiritual quest all monks are participants of. It is actually quite a beautiful story, and it means exactly that. You must understand who you are and what you truly want, and then pursue this desire. But with that done, your life will forever be cursed with following the path of your inner answers. Your life will be set and you won't have any option to turn away from your newfound life. 
those your dreams and the ambitious feeling of a vast array of opportunities will cease. <laughs> I can see out of all the ideologies of this world, this is the one that appeals to you. <gasps> Please, don't, don't disturb me, see? Uh, I'm trying to focus here. When you enter the sacred place, the Grand Melange, you are actually starting the search while looking at others on the spiritual path, in particular three monks, each symbolizing ideas which can stray you away from realizing your dream. The first monk tells you that everyone tries to realize their dreams, but no one is able to. He decided to give up on this fruitless search and instead find pleasure in the dream in itself. Catch your dream, he says. You would have to know where it's going to be, which is impossible, meaning that as your life goes on, your dream may also constantly be changing, so you might never be able to catch it. He is old and it shows the tragedy of how his inner dream will never be realized because he forfeited long ago. So if he tried, he may have achieved it. The second monk is in sickening condition his body and mind are broken and your body suspects it was because of the abuse of drugs. But they are only partially right. He looks exactly like the previous one. Look at the minion seal, not at the visuals. An old wise monk appears and explains to you. People seek escape from the suffering of their lives, but in doing so they only fight more pain. The reason for it is that the problem lies not in the life itself, but in them. It means that people should not try to find escape from their lives, but rather change themselves and then adapt to the world around them. The sick monk was trying to escape from his life's suffering through drugs and only found more pain. The third monk tells you that you can understand yourself by understanding the world around you. The things you fear, the things you hope for, nothing should be discarded and all should be put together in one whole picture and only then you may understand your inner dream and realize it. But also this monk feels that this is an infinite process since there are always new things in your life and so much is always unknown. He fears that an important piece might still be missing. And that is why the poor soul will always be afraid of putting the picture together. And so, after confronting them and what they represent, you finally arrive at the doorway, which is said to divide the land of the living and the land of the dead. Alright, George, you took enough time to tell about the monk culture. I know you liked it, but you should move on. Yeah, you're right. Sorry if I was rude to you, it's just that their culture is really cool. It is, but the three monks were still the same sprite reused three times. Monks are one of the races that are native to Guardia, but there are also the advanced civilizations which came to the planet in pursuit of their own agenda. Those are the Umpani and the Tyrian. We've already met with Umpani, yet all we've learned is that their average representative is more honorable than a even scoundrel who'd sell his family for a nickel. But that's not saying much, is it? When Umpani came to the planet, they've settled in the ruins of an ancient city and, within a very short amount of time, they've rebuilt it from scratch by using only the materials they found in the city itself. This is an indication of how efficient their species is. They are like a machine, which is actually a problem since this is basically a dystopian society here. Within their city you can only go to the places you are ordered. Upon coming to your destination you are asked to present the proper papers and if you go someplace without the order given, out of your own free will, the worst case scenario you'll get killed on the spot. George, you must take into account that this is not their home planet. They came to Guardia to accomplish a military operation. This place is literally a military camp. What else did you expect? Yeah, they appear very militaristic, but the Umpani are often referred to as the intergalactic traders, and this is the trade that stands out the most. 
Case in point, remember who was the dealer of the smuggled weaponry? And another example, when you go with the order to get your equipment from the supply depot, you have to pay for this equipment, as if it was a store. So yes, this is a military camp, but this doesn't negate the fact that their culture can be both militaristic and trade in society. The culture is like a dystopian machine which is operated by the principles of bureaucracy and militaristic and economic discipline. This doesn't make any sense. Total dictatorship and regime negates free market and growth of economy. This is a solid point. But you seem to forget that we assume that this is a perfect system. Do you remember how in 1984 we and Brave New World, the society was in total and complete control, which also means that their economic circulation is perfectly calculated. The internal economy serves as one big unit, while growth comes from the external economy. The Umpania exactly like this, and this is why they are called the intergalactic traders. Because of their dystopian society, the only way they can survive is by being the intergalactic traders. If you say so. The militaristic trait is also perceived in the fact that the Umpani came to Guardia in search of Astral Dominaya, but as soon as the terrain came as well, the species whom Umpani waged an open war, the focus quickly shifted from the original mission to destroying the enemy. Now, considering just how much different the monk and the Umpani cultures are, they are at peace with each other. Imagine now just how different the terrain must be that upon learning of their culture you can clearly see that they juxtapose the Umpani to such a degree that there can literally be no peace between them. And that goes for every single nation of this game. Every one of them has a distinct ideology, which often seems incompatible with others. Yet somehow they manage not only to fight each other, but also to make alliances and coexist. The politics of this world feel authentic, which is another reason why I call this game grounded and realistic. I mean, for thousands of years our own world has been filled with cultures which differ just as much, if not more, than cultures of Guardia. And there you have it. To reflect this world, you can make an easy gameplay with cheerful visuals and make the player feel safe and comfortable. It would simply not fit with the dark and unwelcoming and cool atmosphere of this world. To make the world feel as grounded and close to reality as possible while still being a fantasy game, Bradley made this game hardcore and made its atmosphere bleak and melancholic. This is a great observation, George, but it's not the meaning of the game, only a setup. If Bradley wanted to make a game about this, he could have made it without sustaining the forced immersion and therefore without sacrificing a big part of the audience. The fact that the game is designed in such a manner is an indicator that he had a grander intent. I am afraid that you should go even deeper. Don't worry, Seal. I am in this to the end. As we progress further in the game, our party becomes stronger. Mr. Lizardman became a master of the sword. The Swarm Zin became a ninja alchemist with a blaster. Yep. Our priest was so dedicated in his spiritual path that he became the Lord himself and Bilbo remained, as he was initially, a bard who contributes by irritating enemies or making them fall asleep. To be fair, he was actually a major help to the party. The unwelcoming nature of Guardia seems to deteriorate since now that you are strong, everyone wants to benefit by using you or lying with you. Just as your strengths grew, your perception of the world broadened as well. You learn not only of nations and history of Guardia, but also of spaceships flying in orbit, of species that want to profit of the planet, even a little bit about the intergalactic political situation. By the way, this is an interesting aspect of the game. Selective sci-fi elements. 
They are brightly colored and feel contrast into the green fantasy world of Guardia. It has artistic significance. The technological wonders appear as miracles. Our party perceives them this way, the same way natives of this planet do. There is something truly magical to this game. In its style hidden the fantastic beauty which can be summed up by this scene. In the middle of the field of wild orchids, Kira raises her head and sees a beautiful floating grey whale. But nobody else in the party sees him. Since they are all asleep, the beauty is lost on them. The game doesn't actually show this whale, only text describes it. The question is, do you, or even more important, can you see the whale? There is no whale. What she sees is a spaceship. As you said, the technological wonders are godlike to the party. She doesn't understand what she sees, and this is the only way her mind can explain it. But still, this is a magnificent scene. If you are amazed already, then wait until you see the ending. So now, after we've done all we wanted and became the strongest group of people in the world, it is time that we go to the last dungeon. This is by far the hardest dungeon of the entire game, with each level presenting a different sort of challenge, yet the second level holds a special interest. The floor itself is spaced around a puzzle, yet along the sides of the rooms there are six locked cells. What is caged within those cells are the most dangerous creatures of this world, the six gorars. Well, except one of those is just the first boss from the very first dungeon who dies in literally one hit, just to make you feel how powerful you became. The fights with gorars are optional, pretty much how weapons throw in Final Fantasy VII. And just like in that game, only two are what you can call super bosses, namely the Fiend of the Nine Worlds and the Beast with One Thousand Eyes. Those guys are epic. They require not only the perfectly balanced and leveled up party, but also the perfect strategy to defeat them. It is a real challenge, which also means that it is incredibly fun to fight them. Now after some time I've managed to defeat every gore, including the fiend, except for the beast. Now the problem with him is that he has an overwhelming amount of health. 9099 HP to be precise. Every turn I can manage to deal 250 points of damage, average. This means I would have to survive for 36 and a half turns, yet the attacks of the beast are capable of wiping my body in one hit. So to survive 37 turns with the high probability of dying on each one would be impossible. So after fighting for two and a half hours, I gave up. Killing this enemy is a true achievement, and only a few people ever managed to defeat him. So now that we've came this close to a finale, let us finish our adventure. So this is why Bradley had to sustain the forced immersion. I knew that the ending would greatly impress you, George. You are way too sensitive. Yeah, I can't deny that. The sequence was simply ingenious. I won't spoil anything for you. I will not show or tell anything that would ruin the ending for you. I can, however, tell you the artistic meaning of the ending. As the credits roll, you see the world which you've overcame, no matter how alien and unwelcoming it was. Yet you don't feel triumphant, instead you feel like a survivor. The dominant emotion is a sense of sadness as if you've just been reminded of your own mortality. A sudden realization might occur that Guardia had its influence on you. In adapting to the world, you not just learn the mechanics of the game, but also the philosophy, the lesson of this world. 
The lesson is the understanding of the futility of conflict and the deceptive nature of ideologies, which try to trick you into sacrificing your life in vain. Well, in other words, the only things that matter are the lives of you and those dear to you, while everything else is meaningless. So the meaning of the game is that life is the most important thing? Sounds kinda simple. It would be simple, if not for the way it was delivered. The key here is that this game exemplifies what games can achieve as an art form. So it can not just give you ideas and emotions, not just show you the meaning. They can create an experience in which you learn the meaning on your own. The randomness in so many aspects of this game would be considered a flaw on its own, but within the context of the game it actually reinforces the meaning and helps to reflect the chaotic nature of the real world. The same can be said about the hardcore gameplay and how it reflects the difficulty of life. And people and nations of this dog -eat dog world of Guardia reflect our own. Every aspect of this game was dedicated to one goal makes the player experience the true value of life and the treacherous nature of ideologies. That is art. So to summarize, Wizardry 7 is one of the greatest RPGs of all time. The battle and RPG systems are amazing. The story and the gameplay are both excellent. Everything in this game works in perfect harmony and even what seems like a flaw at first turns out to actually work in the game's favor. So yeah, Wizardry 7 is a great game. Ooh. We've done it still. We've beaten Wizardry 7. So now that it's over, what are you going to do, George? I'll see you. There is always another game.